Okay. All right, so welcome to the webinar for navigating the professional school application process. As I said, my name is Julie Maddox. Um, I work in the Class Advising Center with pre-professional students and um, support students through the application process. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves. So, uh, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself next? I'm Brian Eichenhout. I also work with our pre-professional students. Uh, I work with mostly biomedical science, psychology, sociology, some exercise science, um, behavioral neuroscience. Uh, Alexis? Hi, everyone. I'm Alexa Shavey and um, Senior Academic Advisor in the Class Advising Center. I work with all of our pre-professional areas, uh, so pre-med, dental, pharmacy, optometry, vet, um, chiropractic, and podiatry, as well as a number of our science majors. And Danny? Hi everyone, I'm Danny Lauer. I'm one of the advisors in the center as well. I predominantly work with pre-med and pre-chiropractic students. And Holly. Hi everyone, my name is Holly Lorenz. I'm also an academic advisor in the Class Advising Center. I work primarily with pre-med and pre-dental, but I also see pre-podiatry. Okay, and we have a few others on our team who are not on this webinar today. So Alexis Gunn is our graduate, graduate assistant in our office, and she also advises pre-professional students and science majors. Um, also, Allison Sluzarchuk is our advising assistant, and you may um, see an email from her during the application process or need to email her for something. So um, just be familiar with her name, Allison Sluzarchuk. All right, so we'll get started with our presentation here and just an overview of what we'll be covering today. Um, we have the Grand Valley application file and the process. So that is for the committee letter. Um, we do committee letters for medical and dental applicants and we'll be getting into that a lot more in depth. Also just the process for requesting the committee letter and letters of evaluation. We'll also be talking about entrance exams like the MCAT, DAT, OAT, PCAT, uh, personal statements, and the primary applications, secondary applications, um, also some of these new tests that have been um, coming into play the last couple of years like CASPER, AAMC preview, and other tests you may need to take as part of the process. Okay, so there are lots of resources to help you um, with this process. So um, over on the right hand side, you'll see the different websites for the different applications. So the AAMC.org, that is um, where you'll find a lot of information on the AMCAS application, that's the MD application, also the MCAT, um, MCAT prep resources. There's lots of great information on the AAMC website. AACOM is for DO and then the ACOMAS application, which is the DO application. Um, we also have the dental is ADSAS, FarmCAS, OptumCAS, FEMCAS, ACCOMPASS, I think you might say that for the podiatry application. Um, and then the chiropractic colleges, they used to have a common application, but they now are more, you, you would apply directly to the individual schools rather than a common application. But if you do wanna see information on chiropractic schools, you can go to that chirocolleges.org. Over on the left-hand side are all of the Grand Valley resources. Um, so on our website, we have a ready to apply link where you can see application process handouts. Um, we have these new application trackers, which actually, um, look just like the applications themselves. So if you want to see what the applications look like and the format and what you need to enter as far as, you know, personal statements and experiences, things like that, you can check out our new application trackers. Um, we also have a link to our committee letter application on there. Um, our committee letter application is currently open. It opened March 1st and it will close on August 1st this year and every year. And we also have our self-assessment form. We have a link to that. And that is your first step in requesting a committee letter from Grand Valley. Um, you'll need to fill out the self-assessment and then um, you'll meet with one of us to review it. Um, we also have a link if you'd like to have us read your personal statement. 
you can submit it on our website. We aim for a one to two week turnaround time um, for personal statement reviews. So feel free if you have a draft and you'd like us to read it, you can submit it there. And we also have a YouTube channel. Um, if you want some pointers on how to write your personal statement, we have YouTube tutorials out there. So just real quick, let me see if I can get that website up to show you here. So from our pre-professional landing page, we have our ready to apply link right here. And this is where you'll find this year's webinar um, shortly. This currently is last year's webinar. Um, and then we have a link right here to the committee letter application. Also a link to have your personal statement reviewed. Over here, you can see the application process sheets for the different professions. So for instance, this is the medical school one. It gives you all kinds of information about registering for your exam, how to look at different schools, um, what's on the applications, the committee letter process, and then a nice timeline, which we'll be covering a little bit later in this presentation as well. And then here are these activities trackers that we I was talking about. These are new. And so you can see here, if you open that, sorry, it's taking a minute. Um, this is very similar to how your um, AAMC application will look like. So you can enter that in if you want to get a head start. Uh, you kind of know what to expect on there. Okay. All right, so um, the first question people usually ask is, what is a committee letter and why do I need one? Um, so we write committee letters for our medical and dental applicants. Once in a while, an optometry school might want a committee letter and we're happy to do one if your school needs one. Um, when you are looking at letter recommendations at schools, make sure that you're fulfilling all the requirements at the different schools. Um, many of them for medical and dental will say committee letter preferred. And um, most of the Michigan schools know that Grand Valley does a committee letter, so they are expecting to see that. Um, it is recommended to do it. It really helps to highlight you as an applicant and um, kind of show how you rank compared to other applicants at Grand Valley. Um, as part of the committee letter application, you'll have individual letters of recommendation sent in. Um, and we attach all of those to the committee letter. So when schools are reviewing your letters, they'll get the committee letter along with all the individual letters attached to it. Our committee letter inc includes a rubric and rankings based on the AAMC core competencies. So if you wanna Google AAMC core competencies, you'll see the different things that you're ranked on in the committee letter. Um, the committee letter application is due August 1st, but that's really just a way for us to end the process. You're definitely gonna benefit from having an earlier application. You're gonna get through much quicker in the application process. Um, just overall in the professional school application process, it's really important to have an early application. So I'd really encourage you to try to aim for like a early June um, time when you have your uh, committee letter application complete. You can and you will actually submit your AMCAS, ACOMAs and ADSAS applications before your committee letter is in and that is totally fine. Your committee letter needs to be submitted by the time your secondary applications are done. Um, so when you submit your primary application, it takes about a month for schools to actually see it. It has to go through verification. So it's gonna take a little bit of time before schools will even see your application. Then you'll have to do secondary applications. Um, with ADSAS, there's not as many secondary applications. So um, we do try to prioritize dental students through this because their process goes a little bit quicker. Um, but uh, usually, you know, 99% of the time we have the committee letter done and submitted by the time your secondaries are, are in. So you're usually not waiting on us um, to hold up your application.
Um, again, the committee letter application can be found by this direct link or on our website, like I showed you earlier. Um, these are the different parts of the application, and I'm going to walk through these with some screenshots. <clears throat> so the first time you log in, you're going to say begin application process, and then this waiver is going to be pulled up. Um, so I encourage you to read it. It's a FERPA waiver. Um, you have the choice of either waiving your rights to access your application file and committee letter or not waiving your rights. Um, I will say that professional schools prefer that you do waive your rights. It just legitimizes the process. Um, it's, it shows a lot better if you waive your rights and you trust that the people who are writing you your letters of recommendation are writing you strong letters. If you choose you do not waive your rights, then that is communicated to the professional schools. Um, we also have an optional waiver. Um, if you would like to give us permission to use your application materials for future, um, for instance, if you have a really great personal statement, maybe we want to use that in, as an example for other students um, for what to write. So feel free if you would like us, if you're okay with us doing that, to check those boxes there and then hit submit. Once you complete the waiver, that's the last time you'll see it. So every time you log into the application after that, this is what you'll see is kind of the landing page, the home page here. We have another link right here for the personal statement review. And then <clears throat> here is where you can get to the self-assessment. So there's a link to fill out your self-assessment form. Um, you'll fill that out and then you'll schedule an appointment with one of us to review it. Um, when, you're, when that meeting is complete, the advisor you met with is going to send you the PDF of your self-assessment and then you're going to upload it here as verification that the meeting took place. GPA calculation, uh, we have a spreadsheet here that you'll download and you'll need to find transcripts from all of your schools you've attended. Um, so any, if you went to community college in the summer or if you transferred to Grand Valley, you'll want to make sure to get that transfer coursework and combine that with your Grand Valley coursework. And then you'll also do a science GPA calculation. All of the um, instructions are in the Excel sheet that you download here. Then here's where you're gonna upload a final PDF copy of your professional school application. So when you're finished with your AMCAS, ACOMAS, or ADSAS application, you're gonna save a PDF and upload it here. You have an option here to update your profile. Um, you can put in an, a headshot if you'd like, a photo. Um, I do recommend that you have a nice headshot taken of yourself um, wearing professional clothing, having you know, pretty basic background, something that you might put on LinkedIn. Um, there are some secondary applications that also want you to include a headshot. So um, just that's helpful to have, have somebody, you know, who has a, nice camera on their phone or something, take a nice picture of you. All right, and then at the bottom, you'll see the questionnaire. Um, I would recommend you look at this soon. It is fairly lengthy. There's gonna be some essay questions. Um, they're short answer, you know, just a paragraph. I think it's maybe 700 characters or something like that. but. Um, this is going to take some time to write, so um, check out this questionnaire soon and start to fill that out. And then the last part of the committee letter application are requesting your letters of recommendation. You may request up to six letters, but it's most common for students to have three to five letters. You need a minimum of three letters in order for um, the committee letter application to be complete. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis to start talking about letters of evaluation. Thanks, Julie. So we get a lot of questions about who should be writing letters of evaluation. Um, so let's talk about who you should ask, um, and then we can talk about how to make sure that those individuals are prepared to write a strong letter for you. 
best word of advice is to make sure that you are asking people who know you well. Um, we do have a general rule of thumb, um, and which is listed on screen there. So three faculty, um, that would include two science faculty, a non-science faculty, um, ideally faculty who have, you, who have had you in class. We also recommend that you have somebody who has worked with you in a professional setting. So if you're applying to medical school, ideally you have a physician, either an MD or a DO. If you're applying to dental school, uh, have a dentist, a pharmacist, if you're applying to pharmacy school and so on. Um, if, you, if you don't have a good connection with uh, say a doctor or a dentist, um, you can also think about who has seen you in a clinical setting. So if you work in a hospital and maybe you typically work, your supervisor is a nurse practitioner or a PA, um, somebody who can speak to your work with patients, that's okay too. And it's also possible to have a character reference. So that could be somebody who maybe has not worked with you in a classroom setting or a clinical setting. That could be maybe a coach or a volunteer supervisor. Um, so, so that's a kind of a well-rounded list of letters there. But again, it goes back to making sure that you're asking people who know you well. You don't want to just have these boxes checked and say, okay, well, I've got three faculty and I have um, a, somebody I shadowed three years ago writing me a letter. You want to really make sure that these people are speaking to your abilities to do well in the profession, um, uh, your ability to do well in professional school. Um, so you got to really think about that. Who are these people who can, can speak strongly about you? Um, Julie also mentioned you want to make sure that you're checking the requirements for individual schools. Um, so while we have that general rule of thumb, you want to make sure that you're checking what the individual schools are asking for. Um, and so making sure you're checking their websites um, to have everything that they, they would like you to have. Um, who not to ask? Uh, so you don't want to, you definitely want to make sure that you're not asking family members. If you're a, going into dental school and your uncle is a dentist, you want to make sure that you're not asking your uncle to write a letter. Ideally, that person would not do so, um, but you want to make sure that you're not asking family members to do that. We also will have students sometimes focus in on title or maybe a, a potential letter of uh, reference who works at a particular medical school or dental school. Um, for instance, the, I, my, neighbor, my neighbor's uncle uh, is on the admissions committee for XYZ medical school. That doesn't matter. That person doesn't necessarily know you. Um, so again, you have to think about who knows you well and can write you a strong letter. Because that's really clear when we read letters of evaluation, it's really clear if somebody knows you well or if they're, they're kind of reaching to try to write a strong letter. Um, ideally, the letters are also current. Um, so if you have applied before and you have letters from a previous cycle, it's really important that you go through the process of trying to update those and get current letters within the last year. I think it's also important to think about who's writing those letters and if you've had regular interactions with them. So it's okay to ask somebody who has maybe worked with you, say, in your freshman year or your sophomore year, especially if there's been continued connection with that individual um, and you've kept it in touch with them. If you have not talked with them in the last two years, probably not the best person to be writing a letter for you. If you are watching this webinar or you're participating today and you're not going to be applying this cycle, then you have some time to maybe think about who could be writing you a letter in a future cycle and really working on investing in those relationships and building those strong connections. If you are, I do want to touch on um, if you are a reapplicant and you do have a previous letter from an earlier cycle that is archived with our office and you would like to reuse that letter, there is a process that you can go through to have those letters retrieved. Um, when you're in the committee letter application, you can put in the information for the evaluator's letter that you would like to use, but instead of putting their email address, you are going to put in our office manager's email address, and that would be Allison Sluzarchek's email. Um, on the FAQ site of the Ready to Apply website, there's some information in there, and you can always reach out to our office too if you need some extra direction on that. All right, let's go to the next slide. So how to request a letter of an evaluation. Once you have your individuals identified who you think could write a strong letter of evaluation, uh, then you have to go through the process of asking them. Um, and you want to make sure you're giving enough notice. You don't want to 
reach out to them the day before you're planning to submit your professional school application. Ideally, you're giving them a month um, so they've got some time to plan how, when they're going to write that letter, some time to get some information from you on what they need to write a strong letter. Um, so ideally a month. The letters, we'd say mid-May is a good time frame to have the letters submitted, um, especially if you're planning to apply early to medical and dental schools. Pharmacy, uh, veterinary, and optometry schools, their application deadlines are much later, so it's okay to have those uh, letters of evaluation turned in a little bit later if you're applying to those professions. So if we say mid-May is a good target, um, you want to also make sure that you're getting information to the evaluators so that they have time to write that strong letter. So it, I have on the bottom of the screen here some things that you can include um, to the evaluators so that they have everything they need to write that. So ideally a draft of your personal statement. It doesn't have to be the finest, final polished draft that's actually in the application, but just a, a general draft so that they know why you're interested in that profession, what motivates you to go into this field, um, and some of the, the strong traits that you're going to be bringing into the field. Copy of a resume. You should always have a resume that's ready to go. Um, so if you don't, don't have something updated, make sure you, you work on that. You can always work at the Career Center to have your resume updated too. And then going back to those guidelines that Julie mentioned a couple slides ago, using the AAMC's letter guidelines, you can also send those to your evaluators. And again, this is a great guide, even if you're not applying to medical school. It's kind of a gold standard for any of the professional areas. Um, and on those guidelines, uh, it talks about what an evaluator, if, they, if they're not familiar with writing a letter, some of the things that they should think about um, in an explanation of those different competencies. So you can share all of those things with your evaluators. And I also say be open to meeting with them. Let them know that you can go to office hours, um, do a Zoom chat, whatever it is to uh, maybe answer any questions that they have too. So Julie had a couple screenshots on there um, from a couple of previous slides. And the very last uh, option on that committee letter application is how to go through the process of getting those letters actually submitted to our office and included in your committee letter application. So if you are doing the committee letter app, you'll hit that green create letter of recommendation. And what will pop up is that list of all those fields. So Julie has me as an example there. She's asking me to write a letter of recommendation. She'll put in my information there. Um, really, really important to make sure that that email address is right because that email is what's going to trigger uh, that email to be sent to your evaluators. So check the information. Um, you wanna put their professional contact information in there. You don't need their cell phone number. You don't need their home address. It can be Grand Valley. It can be a clinic. It could be the hospital. Um, so make sure you're putting their professional contact information in there. Once you click save and send, it's going to then send an email to the individual evaluators with some extra information. In a moment, I'll show you what that email looks like that your evaluators will get. But the great thing about the committee letter application is that it keeps a list of all the different um, evaluators who you've asked for letters. And then you can easily see on there that there's a complete column and you can see yes or no. So um, in this case, no, I have not submitted my evaluation of Julie yet. Um, but when I do, she is gonna get it. She'll be able to see that yes, it's complete. She won't be able to see the contents of my letter, uh, but she'll be able to know and feel at ease knowing that my letter is submitted. If you're getting close to that deadline, so if you're aiming to have your evaluators submit things by May 15th and you're, you are still missing several letters, you have the ability to do the resend email. So you can send a gentle reminder to your evaluators um, that you are getting ready to apply soon and seeing maybe if they have any final questions or um, just kind of checking in with them to get their letters submitted. On the next screen, you will see what it looks like. Um, so this is what the actual email looks like that the evaluators get. So you'll see, you'll see there it says, Dear Alexis, um, tells me who submitted this. So, so Julie is requesting a letter of evaluation. Um, for it'll specify medical or dental school. You can see on the second line there, it says Julie has waived their rights to view the letters. So it's really important and that very first waiver when you start the committee letter application, um, 
that we recommend that you waive your rights. And then that is communicated to those evaluators. If you don't waive your rights, then the, the wording there changes that you have retained your rights to view the, the letter of evaluation. There's a unique link there uh, for the individual to upload their letter and then some guidelines. So again, I mentioned some things that you can share with your evaluators, but all of that will be reiterated in the email that they get. So there's some reminders to make sure that there is the letters on letterhead, that they should have a handwritten signature, should have a date, um, some guidelines on who the letter should be addressed to. So if, they're, if you're applying to medical school, dear, dear medical admissions committee or dear dental admissions committee, it should not be addressed to our office or individual advisors in our office. There's the link for the guidelines of uh, writing a letter through AAMC's guidelines and then uh, some information there about target deadlines uh, that can be helpful. And then of course, Julie's information will be on there. Um, they can reach out to anyone in our office if there's questions. And lastly, on the far right there, it says evaluators will, see the, will receive this from our office email. And so it will be from the advstu at gbsu.edu. So you can communicate that to your evaluators, let them know to watch for that email. And I'll turn it over to Brian. Great, thank you, Alexis. Um, so I just wanted to take a couple minutes to show you the timeline. Um, this particular one is for our um, medical students. And we have all of these available on our ready to apply page so that you can see them. But it's a good way to sort of see how all this falls into place. So the process begins about two years before you would plan to start professional school. So in the fall, um, for our med students, you're beginning your MCAT study plan. Uh, so make sure that you sign up for our test prep course. Usually an announcement comes out for that in November, around Thanksgiving time is usually when we send something out through the Google group. Um, but that applies to um, MCAT, DAT, OAT, and I think um, PCAT. Um, so if, if those are the tests that you're taking, um, be on the lookout for those if you haven't already participated this particular cycle. Um, you'll also register for the MCAT. Usually the registration opens in late October. And then take a practice MCAT and then write the first draft of your personal statement over winter break. Um, the personal statement is one of those things for some students, it's a much easier process to kind of go through and sort of answer that question of, of why medicine. For others, it can be a little bit trickier. So the earlier you start and the more people that you have review that, the easier it can sometimes be. Um, so we usually say around winter break and then kind of revisit that throughout that following semester. In January through March, um, you're going to uh, complete the committee letter self-assessment and then meet with one of us to review it. Um, and then you're continuing to draft that personal statement and then those 15 experiences. Um, as we may have mentioned, um, the, the med school application has a spot for um, 15 experiences and then you can go into a little bit more detail on the three most meaningful. Um, you can also start the committee letter application, um, which opens up uh, March 1st. So that is available for you to start looking at already. Um, and then March through May, you're going to continue uh, working on that uh, committee letter application, getting everything kind of turned in and, and filling everything out. Um, begin asking for letters of evaluation. Um, again, uh, we had mentioned about a month or so, just making sure that they have adequate time to submit that so it's done by early or mid-May. Um, you'll also take your MCAT. A lot, of, a lot of our students tend to take that in that range of um, March through May or um, maybe June, but um, March through May is kind of that hot spot for when a lot of our students take that. And then also you'll want to attend our uh, application workshop um, that we have every year, of course, but also visit us for some of these um, different things in uh, May where we'll actually sit with you and um, you know review anything on the application um, and, and help you make sure that you're uh, covering anything and, and not leaving anything important out. Um, again, we'll uh, in uh, 
early April, you can start having your personal statement and experiences reviewed, um, keeping in mind that we are um, kind of wrapping up our advising season. Usually mid-April is when we start to get a little less busy and we can really devote some more time to that. Um, and then it kind of shifts um, May to June. You're going to begin work on AMCAS and or ACOMAS. Um, some of our med students will uh, apply to both MD and DO schools. So that's why it, it could be either or. And then sending all official transcripts um, with the transcript request form, um, and or you can order them online through Banner. Uh, you'll typically submit ACOMAS in May, and then AMCAS is in June, and then load a submitted copy to the uh, uh, committee letter application. And then June and later, um, the uh, committee letter is initiated after a complete committee letter application is received. And then you'll begin working on secondary applications, um, submit within two weeks of receiving them. And then August um, and later, um, August 1st is our uh, GVSU committee letter deadline, as Julie had mentioned. Um, you can attend some of our interview prep workshop and mock MMI um, events. Uh, we typically have those available in uh, September because a lot of the interviews sort of start during the fall. So that allows you to prepare for that. And we, we try to simulate that um, to be as similar to the experience that you will um, receive when you're going through the real uh, interview process. And then October 15th is the first day to receive offers of admission from, from MD schools. Again, so this is, this is the, uh, um, for our med students, but this is a sample. All of these are, are listed on our uh, website if you wanna view those. And then here are some important dates for the 2023 application cycle. So for uh, AMCAS, which is our MD, uh, it opens May 3rd. And then the first date to submit is May 31st. And then the first date applications are sent to um, MD schools is June 24th. Uh, for ACOMAS, which is for our DO applicants, um, it opens May 4th. Um, and then you can submit any time. And then um, the first date that apps are sent to DO, DO schools is uh, some point in mid-June. For our ADSAS or our, our dental applicants, uh, it opens uh, May 10th, but then the first date to submit is June 1st. Um, for OptomCAS, uh, which is optometry, it opens uh, late June, early July. Um, the dates are not released yet. And then for podiatry, um, it's July and August. And then again, the dates are not released yet. Um, but for FarmCast, um, it opens July 14th. And then lastly, for um, veterinary, uh, it opened on January 20th. And then the first date to submit would be May 12th. And then the application deadline is September 15th at 1159. So I, I just wanna give you maybe a, a good visual to see why it's important to apply early. Um, so this example comes from the University of uh, Michigan Medical School, it's five-year averages, but it takes a look at um, when they, how many applications they got, the interviews that were scheduled, and then the admissions offers. And you can tell um, that it your chances of um, getting an admission offer uh, goes down pretty considerably the longer you wait. So for applications, it, early on in June and July, they received about 4,800 applications. And then that fell pretty dramatically in August to a little under 1,700. And then even more, um, September, it was down to 600. And you know, as you go further on, uh, it, it dropped uh, pretty considerably. With the interviews scheduled in June, July, they had 429. And then in August, it dropped all the way down to 48. And then it was just a handful of students in September and beyond. Um, and then the admissions offers, again, the, at the beginning of June, July, there were 324. It dropped down to 33 in August. And then again, just a handful 
uh, in September and beyond. Um, we recently looked at an article that sort of made sort of a play on this, but sort of pointed out the um, seriousness of, of applying early. Um, and it was kind of looking at this new concept of the word deadline. Um, and it broke it down into different time periods. So for our you know, students who submit it by June 15th, it was considered the bruised line where it won't ruin your chances of getting in, um, but it is already behind thousands of students who have already uh, submitted their application. And then by July 1st, you're kind of in this wounded cap, uh, category where it certainly hurts um, and you know, it might still you get you through, but you're definitely wounded as you kind of cross that finish line hitting the submit button. Um, and then August 1st is sort of the damned line where it's not impossible to get in, but it really, really hurts your chances significantly of, of getting into uh, med medical school if you're after that date. And then the very last one is the dead, and they kind of enunciated that um, dead line um, was September through December. Um, a lot of the medical schools have their official um, cutoffs for these uh, deadlines, but at that point, uh, your chances, as you can tell from the chart below, is, is pretty limited. So I just want to make sure to, to draw a distinction with this. Um, we're not saying you know, that you should rush your application necessarily. Um, it's better to submit a quality application a little later than that ideal date of you know, uh, you know, mid-June um, or even maybe in the, the following cycle if needed than it is to submit an application that isn't your best um, work that you're putting forward. Um, but it's definitely important to put that uh, application and get that submitted as early as possible. Okay, um, and I do want to point out that for um, pharmacy and optometry, your applications, I think, open about in July or so, so those tend to be a little bit later. Um, what to expect on your application. So th this kind of shows you what the applications themselves look like. Um, so on the left-hand side, the AMCAS or the MD application looks similar to this. So this is kind of your dashboard when you log in. You can see the different sections. The identifying information, schools attended, um, coursework, letters of eval, medical schools. Um, so this shows you um, kind of a dashboard of you can check to see when your transcripts have been received, um, when your committee letter has been received. I do want to point out that when you're filling out your letters of evaluation, if you're getting a committee letter, you're only going to put my name in there and that I'm submitting a committee letter. So you do not list your individual letter writers in AMCAS, okay? Or ACOMAS or ADSAS. Um, in ADSAS, you're going to put Alexis's name as the committee letter writer for dental schools. Um, and then all of the other applications use the same company um, called Liaison for their applications. They all look similar to what's on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, so it's the four quadrants of your personal information, your academic history, supporting information, and then your program materials. Um, so the personal information is going to be like your name, address, things like that. Um, academic history, you're going to list every uh, college or university you've attended, and that's where you're going to put in all of your coursework. Um, the supporting information is going to be your personal statement, it's going to be your experiences and also your letters of evaluation or your committee letter. And then the program materials, that's going to be populated by all the schools that you're selecting to apply to. So um, if you pick five schools, you'll see all of those under the program materials and you're going to want to click on each one because they may have some things to complete in there. A really common thing under the program materials um, in ACOMAS, ADSAS, and the others are that schools want you to match up your coursework with their prerequisites. Some questions we get a lot are, what do I put for English? Because I need two semesters and I've only taken writing 150. Um, what we usually tell you is you can put in an SWS course. 
So you'd put in Writing 150 and then an SWS to satisfy the English writing requirements. Um, also, if you've only taken one semester of biology, a lot of schools will take like a higher level biology course, something along those lines. So if you run into any questions as you're filling out those prerequisites, we can we can try to help to the best of our ability, um, but just use your gut, you know, use your um, best judgment for those. Most schools want you to have your prereqs done by the time you up, uh, would start uh, the professional program, not by the time you would apply, although that does kind of vary. So make sure you um, look at school requirements. I also want to mention real quickly that for transcript requests, um, you'll need to request your transcripts to be sent from Grand Valley and every other institution that you've attended. In AMCAS, um, you'll see it says print transcript request forms. Those forms are going to have a couple of numbers. It's going to have your AAMC ID and then also a transcript request ID. Um, you can actually go on to Grand Valley and Banner and you can request an electronic transcript and you follow the prompts to send it to a graduate program and then you can actually, you can choose AMCAS, ADSAS, ACOMAs in there. And then you would just put in your, um, the numbers that it's asking for. Those are found on the transcript request form. Um, and then Grand Valley will send your transcript electronically to the applications. And you can check in here and see when those transcripts are received. So that's something you'll probably want to do as soon as the applications open. I would recommend that you get in there and put in all your um, all the schools that you've attended, and then that'll generate the transcript request form. You can get those transcripts requested, kind of get that checked off your list so you're not waiting around for Grand Valley or your, your community college to send those transcripts in. So, during the COVID-19 pandemic, when it first started, we had a semester where students were able to change to credit, no credit. Um, so a lot of the professional schools started credit, no credit policies. So we do have those on our websites, but for the most up-to-date um, information, you may wanna check the school websites that you're applying to if you have taken any classes credit, no credit. For instance, they may not accept it for a prerequisite course, so um, if you do have credit, no credit, just be sure to check those policies. Um, also, a lot of these programs have just general information on COVID-19. So you can check out the AAMC or the ADEA websites for information. Um, you'll also find when you're completing your applications that some of the applications have an optional COVID-related question. Um, so it may ask, how did COVID affect you professionally, personally, or academically? Um, so it's just a chance to explain if, if you did face, you know, some challenges during the pandemic re directly related to the pandemic, um, you would want to put that in there. Um, I will say that it can be tough to say I haven't been able to find any clinical experience. Um, there, th there's lots of students who have been able to find clinical experience. So while we understand that it's in medical schools understand that it has been tough. Um, you, you do want to have some clinical experience to show. So if you need ideas or help with that, please um, come talk to us. We have um, some great resources on our website um, to help you find some clinical experience. And job shadowing has be, been a little bit easier to find. I, I, won't, I shouldn't say easy because it's still kind of hard, but um, if you especially check like the private practices in the area, um, that might be a little bit easier to get into. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I do see some questions coming in the chat, but we're going to save those to the end. All right, so we are going to pivot and talk a little bit about the written portion of your application. Um, so starting with the personal statement, as Brian had mentioned in the timeline, we really want to encourage you to start your draft early. Uh, the personal statement can be a little bit trickier to write. Sometimes you start writing it one way and then it kind of takes a new shape and form as you edit it over time. And so it's never too early to kind of get a draft going and kind of start to put some words on a page. 
Um, we want to encourage you to use our writing center. We have consultants here to help and they have read many drafts over the years. And so definitely utilize them to edit and provide feedback, especially on grammar and other rules of writing. We as an advising center offer um, feedback and can edit your personal statement as well. There is a link as Julie had shown earlier on both the committee letter application and our website for you to submit your personal statement. And we really want to encourage you to take it to the writing center first. So some of those grammatical things can get worked out. And then we really want to try to provide more feedback on the content. And so helping you really hone in on the things that you want to share, making sure that you know you're you're really expressing yourself to the best of your ability and showing what type of applicant you are. And so we encourage you to edit it as you continue to you know draft it and until you're at that place where it's ready to submit and you know have other people look at it too. Um, one thing that we recommend is if you have individuals who know you well, who read it, you know, ask them, does this sound like me? Am I coming across as genuine? Um, am I, do I sound like myself? You really want your personal statement to match who you are as a person. You know, if you think about an admissions committee reading that personal statement and then potentially meeting you in an interview, you really want to be consistent between those two things. The, you don't want to show up for an interview and have them say, wow, this doesn't sound anything like the person that wrote that essay. And so, you know, the people who know you best can kind of give you some of that feedback. One thing we'll say a lot in the advising center is that we want to encourage you to show and not tell. Um, so what we mean by that is really giving more context to what you're trying to say in terms of the attributes you're expressing. And so, you know, thinking about like, you know, an example could be, I am a really empathetic person, I'm a hard worker, and I, you know, really care for others. That's all really great, but what we really want to do is have you show examples of when you were an empathetic person. So maybe you talk about, you know, an example of a time when you were working as a nurse tech and, you know, there was a patient that was maybe a lot more difficult for people to connect with and you found a way to connect with them and, you know, really sit with them in that time of difficulty and pain. Um, that story is going to show so much more about how you come across as an empathetic person than just kind of saying it to an admissions committee. So really try to, you know, show those, those traits in action and use examples and illustrate things from your experiences um, that, you know, can really illustrate that. That being said, we also don't want you to completely you know, rehash all of your experiences. And I'll talk about that in a second, but you wanna to try to pull new information into the personal statement, new stories, and, um, you know, really expand on that. There is a character limit, so make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, for most MD and DO, it's 5,300, and other schools, it's around 4,500 characters, and this does include spaces. So be mindful, it's, you know, the worst thing is to get to the end and see that you're, you know, with spaces way over and then you really have to edit it down. So kind of keep an eye on that um, as you're going so you don't have to do a ton of, of editing. And then we also recommend using um, WordPad or Notepad in your computer um, versus like a Google Doc or a Word document, mainly just for formatting. Sometimes Google or Word can look a little funny if you copy and paste it into the application. There might be some weird characters that show up. And if you use, use something like WordPad or Notepad, those characters don't tend to um, be a, an issue. So kind of keep that in mind. All right, so going to more of the do's and don'ts um, for your personal statement, um, we really want to recommend that you start with an interesting story. Um, this it doesn't need to be like a traditional academic paper. Um, you get to be a little bit more creative with your writing and your style, and you know try to do something that really brings your reader in right away. And so an example could be. You know, the smell of breakfast filled the room as my dad and I were sitting down to, you know, share a meal together. You know, thinking you're painting that picture for your reader, they're instantly engaged. 
Um, another example could be, you know, despite the dimly lit room, um, you could see the people whose lives have been plagued with addiction. You know, there I am just, I'm right in the story already. I'm interested. I want to hear more. Um, my attention has been grabbed. So try to kind of start your essay in that way. Um, but you can kind of have a, you know, simple introduction, three or so paragraphs and conclusions. So something kind of organized as you've done in school, um, that kind of five paragraph essay structure is okay. Um, but really what we want you to do is just continually show those examples. Um, and you're trying to answer that question of why are you wanting to be a physician? Why are you wanting to be a dentist? Why do you want to be an optometrist? So I always tell students that I work with, try to have that lens in the forefront of your mind as you're writing the entire time. Um, when your reader gets done at the end, there should be no doubt in their mind that you want to become a physician and you know that's the plan for your life. Um, so be really, really forthcoming about that. Um, and you know, try the other kind of tip that I tend to give students is if you're reading it, you know, could that person take out the word physician or medicine and replace it with another medical profession? You know, um, if so, then you might want to edit that and make it more specific to, to medical or dental or whatever field you are choosing to go into. Um, and then, you know, choosing or trying to explain why you're an ideal candidate, those come from those examples and those attributes that you're um, sharing. So some things to avoid, um, try not to make it too gimmicky. Um, a theme can be nice to, you know, weave through your, um, your essay, but try to just, um, you know, not let those become distracting. Don't let those overpower, or overtake your personal statement. Um, and then, like I said earlier, try not to, you know, repeat your entire experience sections um, in that personal statement. You really want to try to showcase this piece of writing as a, a different, um, you know, piece of your application. So think about if somebody read all of those experiences and then they read the personal statement and they are reading all of the same stuff. Um, they're not going to be engaged. They're not going to be, you know, wanting to know more. They're probably thinking, you know, oh, I, I've already read this or this sounds familiar. So try to, um, you know, give them some additional information about you that they haven't learned before. Um, we also want you to try to not have much of a negative tone or try not to be too negative. You know, you can definitely share difficult experiences or negative experiences you went through, um, but try to write about those if you choose to in a way in which shows that you, you know, persevered through something difficult, um, try to show that positive outcome, you know, show that you've demonstrated resiliency in the, in the midst of hardship. Um, you know, those are really the ways you want to kind of talk about some of maybe the more difficult things if you choose to include that. Um, and then we also want to encourage you to not necessarily focus on your own philosophy without giving any context. So, you know, maybe you talk about healthcare disparities, but you know, if you do decide to, to talk about that, make sure you also share how you came to understand that. Um, maybe it was a personal experience. Maybe it was something you learned at a clinical um, position you held or some other exposure to healthcare systems. Um, you wanna try to be an informed applicant and not be, you know, overly critical of the system in which you are looking to become a professional in. Um, so just a few tips there. And then in, Regards to your experiences, um, we also review these as well. So um, as we were talking about earlier, you will have um, experiences that you're gonna write about. So these are you know, all the different types of things you're doing outside of the classroom. So this is your clinical job. This is where you volunteered or the e-board position you held or um, the research you did. Um, and so on the AMCAS, if you're applying MD, there are 15 buckets or 15 kind of spaces to talk about those experiences. And you get 700 characters, again, including spaces. So not a lot of room to talk about them. You kind of have to be succinct and, and kind of, um, you know, pack a punch with what 
uh, characters you do get, um, but you're allowed to choose three as your most meaningful and those you get an additional 1350 characters. So, you know, kind of identify maybe at the beginning, which ones are, you know, the most meaningful, which ones you want to have a little bit more time to expand on, and then you get to write a little bit more about that. Um, most other professions and applications have unlimited entries with around 600 characters. So again, just kind of get in the habit of writing things succinctly and try to, you know, use your characters as to the best ability that you have. Um, so some things to kind of think about in terms of what you want to include, um, the most recent and relevant things. Um, and so you, you really don't want to make it like a resume. Um, with these essays, with these experiences, you really want to focus on, you know, what did you learn? How did you grow? What did this experience teach you? How did this um, experience further your passion to become a dentist or a physician? Um, so really talking a lot more about it from that angle versus, you know, listing out if you were a scribe, all of the things that a scribe does. Most of the folks who are gonna be reading those applications will know what those positions do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, when you think about only having so little space to write, um, you know, don't waste your characters on telling them your job duties. You can really pivot and talk more about what you learned and how you gained, um, you know, some really wonderful experiences through that. Um, a lot of times students will ask, you know, can we put other jobs on there? Does it have to just be clinical? And the answer is include all of the things that you're doing outside of the classroom. And so if you worked at a restaurant or you worked at, you know, a store or you worked in a coffee shop, those are all really, really great um, things to put on your application. And think about those transferable skills. Think about, you know, how you've worked with people and how you've, you know, maybe adapted in a, in a difficult situation or how you um, had to, you know, become resilient in, in some of those difficult times with harder jobs like that in customer service. So think about those transferable skills. And again, if you're not writing about it, schools won't know, you know, so if you worked two jobs on top of volunteering and going to class and being on the e-board, but you don't include those jobs, you know, schools won't necessarily know that about you. And so you definitely want to kind of share all of the things um, outside of the classroom that you did. Um, you definitely want to include, don't, I guess I would say don't include, um, and that's on the other side, but experiences before college. So try to include things that you've only done since you've graduated from high school. So anything post, um, post college or post high school, so in college and beyond. Um, and let's see, I think that for the most part on the do. So kind of going off on the don't um, or things maybe to avoid. Um, again, try to keep things more relevant um, to what you've been doing now. Um, you know, you think about high school experiences are what kind of got you to this point in college. And so you really wanna utilize those college experiences um, to help get you to that next step in professional school. Um, for a lot of times you get questions about future hours or somebody saying, you know, okay, well, I'm applying now and I'm taking a gap year. How do I project those future hours? Um, you want to, you know, really the most weight is going to be considered on what you've already done, right? So we always tell students apply when you're ready, when you're application ready. Um, so you really the stuff that you've already accomplished when you apply is, is what's going to have the most weight. Um, some applications will give you some space um, to, to talk about um, separate future hours. You really wanna be careful in how you report those um, in, in your application. Um, and then again, like I said, don't just explain the duties without reflecting on your experience. Um, you know, you really want to try to be reflective as you can in these experiences, talk about what they've meant to you um, and how they'll, you know, how they're preparing you to become the professional you're seeking. All right, and I will turn it over to Alexis. Thank you. So now you've got this great application. You've got your personal statement written. You have your experiences written. The last thing that you have to do is decide what schools that you want to actually be applying to. Um, so there's 23 optometry schools. You're not gonna apply to all three, 
all 23 optometry schools. There's 70 some dental schools. You're not going to apply to all 70 schools. So you really need to do your research and start to think about who are those schools that you want to apply to. And you want to start your research now. This is not something that you want to do the night before you're planning to submit your application. So you, there are some great resources out there to do your research. Uh, on the slides there, we have um, the MSAR, which is the AAMC's Medical School Admissions Requirement Database. Um, that is an application, that's a database that has some information available for free. The year that you are getting ready to apply is definitely the year to make sure that you're paying for a subscription. So you can get all the extra information that you would want to know, like what is their average MCAT? What is their uh, range of GPAs? Um, what's the, how many in-state, out-of-school out-of-state applicants do they accept? Um, so that's a great resource if you're planning to apply to MD schools. The Dental School Explorer is uh, a great resource for dental students. Um, again, you have to pay for a subscription to that. It's pretty affordable, somewhere in the $25 to $30 range uh, for the Dental School Explorer. Um, the DO schools, if you're applying to DO schools, their, app, their database is free, so you can use the Choose DO Explorer to do your research on your, your DO schools. Um, Farmcast, they have a, a Farmcast school directory if you're applying to pharmacy schools. Um, optometry school has a list, a directory of all the optometry schools. So again, use those resources and start to create your own list. Um, some things that I've seen students do over the years is you keep uh, some type of Google Sheets or document, Word document of what they're looking for in schools. So there's a lot of factors to consider. There's the, the realistic things to consider, you know, what's my GPA, what's my standardized test score, um, what's the average for the schools. You know, I would say that's the first layer that you have to look at and be realistic if you stand a chance to get accepted at that school. Um, it's okay to have maybe a couple schools that you're reaching for, maybe some dream schools, but you don't want to apply to schools that are way out of um, the range of, of where your app, app, academic profile is. Other factors to consider would be region. You know, how far are you willing to travel? Do you want to be close to family? Do you want to be um, in a warmer climate? Um, geographic region is not everything. So you, you're going to spend four years at these programs. You want to make sure that you're getting the academic education that you want. So you can think about what, what type of faculty do they have? What type of support do they have um, available to support students? What's their philosophy? What's their mission? Um, how do they go about educating students? Or do they have recorded lectures? Do they have teams? Um, so there's a lot of different factors that you can look at. Um, cost is another thing. What's the cost for in-state, out-of-state? Um, what type of scholarships do they have available? So you wanna start keeping track of these things and finding out what's important for you um, and what are those schools that meet what you're looking for. I do wanna say it's very important to look at in-state and out-of-state. Every cycle I have students who will apply to schools that accept a very limited number of out-of-state applicants. Um, and while there might be a very, very slim chance, you wanna be realistic about what your chances are getting into those schools. Um, as of most recently, actually we just came from a webinar, um, the current average number of schools to apply to for MD schools is about 16 or 17. Um, so that number has gone up over the last couple of years. We do see a number of students applying to more schools because medical schools are using more virtual interviewing. So you can kind of divert some of your funds um, that were previously spent on travel to applying to more schools. Um, Dental schools, I think the last number I saw was about eight to 10, um, vet schools about four to five um, and so on. So med's gonna be the highest number of place of how many schools you typically apply to. Um, it's important to think about once you are applying, um, don't apply to schools that you have really no interest in going to. You don't want to apply to 20 schools because um, you have to be realistic. There's going to be 20 secondary applications. So once you submit your primary application, it's not done there. You have to do individual applications, um, individual questions and secondary applications to these individual schools. That costs more money. That costs more time. Um, so really think about how am I going to have time to do these things after I submit these applications 
regions and then later in the summer and into the fall have to start filling out the secondaries. You want to make sure you're tracking what's being asked of you as an applicant. So when you submit, you want to make sure that you're being mindful of when are those secondary applications due. We recommend about a one to two week turnaround time in submitting your secondary applications because schools will read into that. If it takes you a month or longer to turn those in, they're going to think that they're not high on your list. Um, so make sure that you are getting those secondary applications turned in right. And those secondary applications are a way to really make your case why you're a good fit for that school. Where the primary application goes to everybody, the secondary applications are unique to those schools. So you don't, it doesn't have to be a copy and paste. You can really um, make your case why you think you're a good fit for that program. Um, and then the last thing for, I mentioned there, there is a cost for the medical school admission requirement, the MSAR. Um, through our office, we do get a discount for certain AAMC products. Um, so if you go to that class advising slash payment website, you can get a discounted rate for the MSAR um, subscription for a one-year subscription. And there's more, right? There's more to do after you've submitted your primary application and you're working on your secondary applications. We've seen a growth of uh, schools that are using uh, different situational judgment tests. So online um, programs that help kind of determine, um, just get a little bit more information about an applicant. Um, so what we've seen is uh, Altus. The Altus suite is very, very common. You're probably familiar with Casper. That's been around for a while. Um, Casper is not the ghost, but it is the uh, situational judgment test that is a combination of both written and video recorded responses. Um, Altus has also created Duet, uh, which is an, uh, a values assessment, and Snapshot, which is another video recorded assessment where schools, the recorded responses are, are sent right to schools. Um, AAMC, um, so this is specifically for our MD applicants. They have uh, Preview, which again is a, another online platform to answer um, situational judgments. So what these essential, there's, there's all sorts of platforms out there. Um, there's Kira Talent, there's different ones that um, you know, every profession is using some combination of these. So likely you're going to have to do one of these throughout the application cycle, if not two or more. So the important thing to do is to make sure you're watching your email, you're reading your instructions, you're finding out what the individual schools are asking you to complete and not missing any deadlines. The other thing for these is these are quite different than your standardized exams. For your OAT and for your MCAT, you know, you spent months preparing for this. The situational judgment tests really are trying to get a genuine look at who you are as an individual and the professional traits that you have. So those would include communication and empathy, equity, ethical decision making. These are not things that you're going to cram and prepare for in, in a week. This is who you are as a person and they're trying to assess that through a couple different ways outside of a, a written application. Best way to prepare is to use some of the sample questions that are available um, on these individual program websites. When you register for the test, you typically are going to get some sort of technology um, protocols that you have to test, make sure your equipment is working. And with that, there usually come some practice questions. So those are a great way to, to, to practice it. Otherwise, just make sure that you're in a quiet place with good internet connection. Um, in not distracted. And then after, these are typically due around the time that your secondary applications are in. So early in the spring, you'll be maybe taking your, your standardized exams, working your primary application. Uh, once you get that primary application turned in, then that's when you can start to focus on um, any type of online situational judgment tests that you'll need to do. Okay, so, um, it is important to know your GPA and in the committee letter application I mentioned we do have that GPA calculator that you can use. Um, it is on our website as well. Um, so schools, uh, when you apply through these common applications are going to be calculating your GPA and they're going to be kind of slicing and dicing your GPA a bunch of different ways. So the example shown here is on the AMCAS application. Um, you'll see that they calculate your freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Um, they come up with a cumulative undergrad GPA. Um, they also do a post-bac 
undergrad. That's any courses you, are, you have taken after your first degree. That shows up in a separate line, but then it also shows up in your cumulative. So if um, you are planning to take post bac coursework or graduate coursework in a master's degree, um, those GPAs will show up separately and a lot of schools will look at that as a fresh start. So it just really depends on the school, how they view those credits. Also, it has to be usually a significant number of credits. Um, most schools will want like around 24 credits or so as a post bac or a graduate student. Um, for it to be that um, fresh start, for it to be more significant for them to look at. Um, you'll also see that there's three different uh, columns. There's a BCPM, that's your biology, chemistry, physics, and math. All other is AO. That's like your non-science GPA. And then you have the total. Um, I'm not sure why high school is on here because they don't require your high school transcript or you don't put in your high school GPA, but it's on there. Um, so you can kind of see what GPAs they look at. Um, most schools, it's going to be very important for you to have, you know, a strong BCPM and overall GPA. Um, most of these um, are also going to count repeated courses. So they would count the first attempt of a course and also the second attempt of a course. And they count courses from every institution. They put it all into one big GPA. Um, just some resources for MCAT. Um, I think Brian mentioned earlier that we do our test prep course. Um, that's for MCAT, DAT, uh, OAT, and PCAT. We also do a separate GRE um, course in both fall and winter semesters. The test prep course is just in the winter semester. Um, but if you are interested in doing the test prep course, if you're applying next year, um, make sure you leave your Thursday evenings available. Um, that's usually 6 to 9 p.m. You can find a link to our test prep course on our website and you can put your name in that you're interested in getting more information. And then if you're applying next year, we'll send you the information on test prep once that registration opens up. Um, and we usually say with our test prep course, it shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. There's lots of great resources out there to use. Um, so Kaplan has resources for all of these exams, Princeton Review, Exam Crackers, um, some of these are more specific to pre-med, like UWorld, um, Wiki Pre-Med, um, and then some are specific to the DAT, so like the DAT Boot Camp, Crack the DAT, DAT Destroyer. Um, so there's a lot out there. Make sure that you're doing your research to determine what's going to work best for you. Um, I will say that, you know, some of those test prep companies offer courses that are like thousands of dollars. And, you know, they are really good, but they're not, you know, the golden ticket to getting a perfect score or a strong score. So um, you don't have to be able to afford, you know, a really expensive course like that. There's lots of low cost ways um, to get some great prep. Um, I will also say really the, the gold standard or the things to start with um, are the AAMC materials for MCAT, the IDEA, uh, materials for DAT. So you really want to go to the source, um, the official um, test resources. All right, and then we have just a couple more slides and we'll get to your questions. All right, so like we've said throughout this webinar, we are here to help you. We are here to support you. Um, there is a lot of moving parts in this application process. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, our contact information is there. Um, we do work through the summer. So we'll be um, in our offices in Mackinac this summer. If you have questions, um, we'll be able to meet with you over Zoom as well if you're not gonna be local to Allendale. Um, speaking of the um, self-assessment, and we mentioned that we would be able to help you with your personal statement and essays, we do have some special appointment times available in May and I believe in June as well that we have set aside to help you all in that process. So we are requiring that you give our office a call to schedule. Um, and our office staff will be able to help you figure out a time that we have set aside for um, your self-assessment, which is going to be a half an hour meeting. 
And then we can also help you during those times with your application review. Um, and those could be anywhere from maybe a half hour or if you feel like, you know, if you have your application essays and your personal statement, you might wanna try to schedule two back-to-back -back appointments. So a full hour, so we have enough time to get through that. Um, so our phone number is there. Please call our office to schedule with us. And we hope to uh, help you out during this application process and give you some good feedback on your readiness to apply and your application materials. And I did want to point out, I have a typo on this slide. It's Alexis Gunn, not Alyssa. <laughs> All right, and that um, kind of concludes our webinar for today. There are some questions I saw that popped up in the chat. So I am going to turn it over to Holly to kind of help us figure out the best approach to getting to those questions. Sure, thanks. Um, so I did organize them a little bit. The first section is about letters specifically. Um, I think Julie had already answered about updating letters between cycles if you're a reapplicant. But one of the other questions was if you request more letters in a particular school accepts, who will decide what letters are sent to that school and how is that decided? So, um, and I believe uh, the student who asked signed off, so I'll email her too. But um, just so everyone knows, all of the letters you send to the committee letter application will be sent to the schools you apply to. It's going to be in one packet with the committee letter. And we do our best to put all of your um, letters by an order of strength so that um, if schools only accept three letters, three to four letters, and you have five letters in there plus the committee letter, um, schools can decide to stop reading if they want to at some point. Um, it's not going to affect your application. Um, a lot of schools count the committee letter as one letter. So, um, but yeah, they would, they would accept that. Um, and all of your letters are going to go to each school. Um, real quick, Holly, going back to the um, reapplicant question, I think the question was, are the letter writers expected to write a whole new letter or just update the dates? I would say if you have had continued, um, continued contact or continued work with that person, I would recommend that they rewrite their letter. I would kind of put it up to the letter writer. You can you can say, um, you know, I, I would like an updated letter if you're still willing to support me in my professional school application. Um, feel free, you know, to update your letter. Um, they may want to put some new things in there if they've still had some continued, um, you know, some continued experience with you since last year. Um, others, they might have talked to you in a year, so they might just update the date. Um, but we do recommend having at least one, uh, one or two current letters from people that you're currently working with. Great, thanks, Julie. Um, the next um, question we have is the committee letter is not submitted with our primary app. Is it submitted with our secondary applications? Correct. I think when is that submission, submission happen? Well, I would say it's submitted sometime between when your primary application is submitted and when your secondaries are submitted. So um, it's sometime in between. Usually there's about a month, month and a half um, in between when you submit your primary application and then when your secondaries are done. So um, the committee letter takes about three weeks or so um, to be written from the time that you submit it, um, usually about three to four weeks. So usually that timing works out. The next question we have is about logistics for contact information. So when applying, would it be best to put your personal email or your Grand Valley email on your application? I would lean towards the Grand Valley email because it's professional looking. It shows that you're a GVSU student, um, but you want to put the email that you're going to be checking a lot. <laughs> So um, hopefully you're checking your Grand Valley email um, just as much as you're checking your personal email, but I would recommend the Grand Valley email. All right, and I think our final question, unless anything else comes in in the chat, is do individual schools set their own deadlines for when CASPER or the AAMC preview scores should be submitted? I believe they do, and they will let you know when those are due. 
Is that, did you get that sense to Alexis? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's my, my take too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you, you should be questions. able to, okay, great. You should be able to go in, I think, if not right now, fairly soon and, and schedule those exams, the Casper and preview. So any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for attending today and we'll have this recording up shortly. So take care, bye-bye.